It's 1981. Just one year into the 80s, we would be introduced to a slew of things that would make this decade so iconic. A time when it was more than appropriate to roll down your car window at a stoplight and ask for some mustard. Pardon me, would you have any gray poupon? But of course. When fast food would forever be changed with the phenomenon known as the McRib that would be unleashed unto the masses. The most 80s car ever was introduced with winged doors and a stainless steel frame with the DeLorean. A little plumber known as Jumpman would rule the arcades against a gorilla in Donkey Kong. And music videos would rule cable networks with MTV. But catchphrases and video games aren't the only things that we first got a look at. In the realm of horror, we would not only see the number of titles more than double, it would also be a year that a certain subgenre would overpopulate. This is 1981, the year of the slashers in our 80s horror memories. You know, I, I think my favorite thing about being a horror director and, and having the privilege of being in this community is that there are so many subgenres of horror. And, you know, I think um, in the 80s was that, I, I guess, time that's really paramount time in my life where I was able to figure out my likes and desires as it related to horror. What would 80s horror even be without a good old fashioned slasher? It's the comfort food equivalent to a more sophisticated film. We all know how these movies play out, but we flock to the multiplexes anyway. After the success of Friday the 13th, production companies put a rush out on these films, on the cheap to capitalize on genre. Compared to the year before, 1981 had at least 30 slashers released that year. Most of them are pretty forgettable today, to say the least. For every now debatable classic like The Prowler, Butcher Baker Nightmare Maker, or Dark Knight of the Scarecrow, we would get things like Graduation Day or Final Exam. And you know what? Even the duds have something fun about them. While in this particular year we didn't get introduced to a killer to stand the true test of time for the masses, we did get a few notables worth mentioning which didn't get the justice that they deserved at the time. So let's sit by the campfire, kids, as I tell you four tales that will keep you up at night. In the town of Valentine Plus, there are many ways to die. Take your pick. My bloody Valentine. Ah, yes, Valentine's Day. The day we shell out countless amounts of money to prove to our loved ones how much they mean to us. A date synonymous with red roses, greeting cards, and a box of toothpaste-filled chocolates. However, in the town of Valentine Bluffs, you may just receive a box with a bloodied heart. And they say true love never dies. My Bloody Valentine, George Mahalko's My Bloody Valentine, which is a, a, a wonderful piece of, of Canadian slasher history. Released that February, My Bloody Valentine tells the story of the townsfolk of Valentine Bluffs, a small mining community which has a dark history involving several fatalities in an accidental explosion in the coal mine. The accident's sole survivor, Harry Warden, began taking revenge on those he deemed responsible. Now years later, and the memory of Harry just a distant memory, a group of young miners and their girlfriends begin to organize the very first Valentine's Day dance since the accident. But once the body count resumes, it appears as though Harry Warden is out to finish what he started. It's no secret that most slashers are identical in plot and setup, especially in the early formations of the genre. But what separates this film from the plethora of slashers from 1981 and arguably the remainder of the decade, is its treatment of the characters. For the most part, we go to these movies for the kills, but everyone here is just so damn likable, you're rooting for all of them to make it. But when they go out, they really go out. It stands out for that, I think, for a lot of reasons. And it also, there's, a, there's an element of, of 
of humor to it. You know, there's some general, some genuine goofiness to that movie. Um, it is the only deaths where some a movie I think where somebody is murdered with wiener water <laughs> um, as they're drowned in a in a big tub of boiling hot dogs. Um, but you know, the wiener water were murder. That's that's. Uh, uh, I think you could do a, you know a sequel to that one called that you know wiener water murders. But it'd be great. However, at the time, audiences weren't allowed to see just how far the movie went. Before release, the film had to remove so much gore to receive its R rating that nine minutes had to be excised. Part of that is, is its release being so close to the assassination of, of John Lennon. So there was a real backlash against these slasher violent films uh, in the wake of that killing. One could say its underwhelming box office take could be due to how tame the kills ended up being compared to another Paramount release the year prior. Despite it being a commercial failure, it has aged wonderfully and received a restoration from Scream Factory, complete with the edited scenes in all of their glory. While plenty of slashers churned out a series of sequels, it's both a shame and a blessing that this film never got that chance. Believe me, I could watch countless films about a miner seeking out revenge. I mean, his image alone is far better than a fisherman and a black rain slicker. But sometimes, for the best ones, a one and done is really all you need. My Bloody Valentine ended up finding a new audience in 2009 when a 3D remake was released. During that period of time, it seemed like everyone was trying to cash in on both the remake and the 3D trend, with most of them being pretty unmemorable. But former Wes Craven editor Patrick Lussier understood the assignment by bringing the fun campiness of the 80s, which had been missing in these remakes. It fared both critically and commercially better than the original, and was one of the best times that I've had in a theater. But if it weren't for that film, I may not have found one of the best slasher films of the 1980s. Coming soon from Universal Pictures. Oh, the fun now. So that was, interestingly, one that I had on video. I didn't see the theaters, but I saw it on video. When you first hear the name Toby Hooper, more than likely you will automatically associate his name with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre or Poltergeist. And I can't really blame you. Those two films were staples for me growing up and are widely considered important pieces of cinema. How his career never exploded like the other greats in horror is beyond me. Like most of us who grew up in the age of video stores and before the era of streaming, I would often see the box art of his titles without knowing his association with them. One in particular, which was sandwiched between his two most popular films, had a cover so misleading that it could easily be construed as a bad direct-to-video romp. Despite what the poster promises you, this movie has nothing to do with creepy clowns. Released at the tail end of winter, Toby Hooper's The Fun House follows four 33-year-old looking teenagers who go to a trashy traveling carnival. After deciding that it would be fun to spend the night at the carnival's funhouse ride, they witness a murder by a man wearing the mask of Frankenstein's monster. Now locked inside, the friends must escape from the deformed killer and the carnival's psychotic workers. Sounds awesome, right? The movie was Hooper's first major studio picture after his very successful TV movie, Salem's Lot. Universal Studios wanted to dip their toes into the teen slasher sandbox after Paramount's success with Friday the 13th. Unfortunately, despite having critical praise, the funhouse just didn't connect well with audiences. Yes, compared to other slasher films unleashing upon moviegoers, this one is a little slower. But it is very unique and not at all a carbon copy of the heavy hitters. And having it set at a carnival just makes it all the better. Carnival horror just isn't touched on enough as it should be. From gems like Ghoulies 2 to more recent fare like the underrated Hellfest, I can't think of a single one which doesn't at least offer a fun time at the movies. And the Funhouse is no exception. 
Top that off with special effects maestro Rick Baker, and a ticket to this show is more than worth the price of admission. When I was a kid, my father, who liked technology, so we had like Betamax, and we actually wound up getting a, a VCR very early on, uh, I worked very hard to get a second VCR. So I would rent movies, and I would copy those movies, so I had a huge library of horror movies, and one of them was The Fun House, which I watched over and over and over again. Not just for the titillating bits, but for the reveal of that creature, and the design of the creature, and the look of the creature. It just, to me, ca encapsulated everything that I loved at that time of what horror movies could do in terms of how it made me feel. It was both scary, it was intriguing, it was visually interesting, it was funny, and uh, it ultimately it transported me to a world that I was not familiar with. on for terror is not over. Friday the 13th, part two. If there is one thing that you can expect yearly in the slashers of the 80s, it's a sequel. The film to do it first comes from the one that really jump-started the craze, Friday the 13th, part two. Okay, this one is a little bit of a cheat. But how can we talk about slasher films without bringing up one of the biggest stars of them all? As we have mentioned in the 1980 episode, Jason will forever be cemented as the face of the franchise. But picture yourself in a crowded theater of some horror movie, and suddenly the trailer for this comes on. Imagine how shocked you would be. You have to remember, this was during the days before Al Gore invented the internet. There would be no way of knowing a movie where the killer dies at the end would continue. Unless you were an avid reader of Fangoria or something. You would probably think to yourself, how in the hell could she come back after getting her head chopped off? Well, friends, that question was answered by unleashing one of the biggest villains of all time, Jason Voorhees. Released less than a year after the original, Part 2 picks up two months after final girl Alice decapitated Mrs. Voorhees. While alone in her apartment, Alice finds that very head inside her refrigerator and ends up getting killed by an ice pick. As it turns out, little Jason never really drowned and has been living as a hermit in the woods. After seeing his mother killed, his heart fills with a taste for revenge. Five years later, a group of new counselors set up shop at a new training center, neighboring the condemned Camp Crystal Lake. But after the new counselors once again ignore the warnings of Crazy Ralph, the body count resumes. The first Friday the 13th stands as a classic for a reason, yet the first sequel does what every great horror sequel should do by making them bigger and better with a larger budget and more scares. Gone is the mystery element of who the killer is, which never truly worked in the first place. And instead, we see our killer with a sack over his head. We don't get to the iconic hockey mask until the third one, but his appearance in this is still equally frightening. It's very reminiscent of the killer from The Town That Dreaded Sundown. The only difference is Jason's mask has only one eye hole. In my VHS days as a teen, I proudly showcased this series on my shelf, but I always found myself skipping the first one and going straight into part two. Not only does it pretty much show you everything you need to know what happened in the original, but the pacing is so much better, and the quirks of the characters feel even more endearing. We also get an equally great final girl with Amy Steele's Ginny, who ends up having a better fate than Alice. Sean S. Cunningham sat this one out as line producer Steve Miner took on the directing duties. He would go on to have a hell of a career directing films like House and Halloween H2O. Also notably missing is the makeup effects from Tom Savini. However, the effects are still as good, using Savini's work as a blueprint. Instead, Savini went on to work with makeup on a different slasher film. Summer five 
years ago is about to happen again. And again. And again. The Burning. Volcano and Dante's Peak. Armageddon and Deep Impact. Christine and Halloween Ends. Okay, so maybe that's not the best example. But you see where I'm going with this. Pretty much since the beginning of cinema, films with similar plots have been released at the same time from different studios, resulting in the moniker of twin films. Whether it's coincidental or just a race to see which production gets out the fastest, the one to hit the screens last is usually regarded as a ripoff. But one in particular in the slasher genre stands out above the rest. The summer camp slasher, The Burning. I mean, The Burning? It's sort of like a, it's not, it's a classic, but it's not in the running with the ones and the titles that we still talk about today. Released just one week after Friday the 13th Part 2, The Burning follows a summer camp caretaker who is victim to a prank gone wrong, which leaves him horrifically burned. Five years later, he returns to the camp, armed with a pair of garden shears, to seek vengeance on a new set of counselors. It's perfectly easy to look at this film and dismiss it as a straight-up copycat of Friday the 13th. And for the longest time, I too felt the same way. When visiting video stores throughout my youth, I would snicker to myself at all the VHS covers of movies that were clearly cashing in on the summer camp mayhem of Crystal Lake. And boy, did some of these look hilariously bad. And this was, you know, before the days of IMDb. You couldn't just, you, you couldn't look up what this was. So it was based solely on the box art. And um, so for me, I think that my uh, love of these kind of 80s horror films stemmed from VHS cassette tapes and box art. Um, if, you know, I probably missed some amazing gems because they didn't have great box art. Even at the time of release, some critics even called it out as an obvious clone to Friday the 13th which is a possible reason for its low box office take. But those that saw it would be treated with a damn fine script and amazing practical effects from Mr. Savini. He brought his expertise used on the first Friday the 13th film and implemented it even further here and amped up the gore to 11, most notably during a massacre involving some of the counselors on a raft. Absolutely brutal. It should be noted, too, that while there are some similarities, the script was actually written back in the late 70s, before Mrs. Voorhees had even unleashed her wrath. The film's villain, Cropsy, was based on a New York urban legend about an escaped mental patient who, after the death of his son, kidnaps several children. That in and of itself would make an interesting movie, but the screenwriters took this campfire story and spun it into a fun little thrill ride that just does not let up. If only this came out at a different time, maybe we would have had as many films featuring Cropsy as we did Jason. Recently, there have been many throwbacks to a time when these films were actually fun, with some even capturing the magic of 80s cinema, like The Final Girls, or even playing around with the slasher icon tropes in the criminally underrated Behind the Mask, The Rise of Leslie Vernon. And for better or worse, Michael Myers has even returned to dominate the box office. So regardless of which side of the fence you sit on, it's a good time to be a horror fan. What are some of your favorite slashers from this time? No matter what generation you're from, boomers to Gen Z, we would love to hear your thoughts on what brought you to horror. Leave us a comment down below, we'd love to talk to you. Until then, my fellow gorehounds, stay tubular. On the next episode, we focus on two horror icons whose legacy continues to this day. The Queen of Ween, hostess with the mostess, Maven of the Macabre, Elvira, and television host and film critic, Joe Bob Briggs. So strap yourself into your favorite armchair and perfect that heaven bump hairstyle. Until next time. Pumpkins, Darcy, and lots of them.
Hi friends, your humble narrator Tyler Nichols here, and I hope that you enjoyed that episode of 80s Horror Memories. If you missed our previous episode, click over here. If you want to see more from our series, click up here. And if you're not subscribed yet, what are you doing? Subscribe right here. And most importantly, stay spooky, folks.